Our speakers today are James Rulo and Ingrid Hess, and they will be speaking on the Bail Conundrum. Please join me in welcoming our speakers. I believe James will be up first. This is the project yeah. to forward. Okay, perfect. Ooh, okay. I'm a short guy. Um, some of you may have, uh, well, hopefully all of you saw the introductions that we had um, for this piece, a nice, beautiful, long introduction by uh, Ingrid Hess and James Rulo, Crown Prosecutor. That's because I was very negligent in sending a resume in advance. Um, so a very li quick little bit about me. Um, I've been practicing in Alberta now for probably around eight to eight and a half years. I started my career here as a defense um, lawyer and I've been now with the Alberta Crown Prosecution Services for in November it will be two years. And we're here to talk about bail. And I'm not going to ask for a show of hands about how many of you, or if any of you, are gone through the bail process? <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but I figured we'd begin a little bit with a discussion as to what that bail process looks like. It begins with an arrest, and where it goes from there can depend very significantly based on the nature of the charge, someone who's got a prior criminal record versus someone who doesn't have a prior criminal record. Oh. I'm trying to get a little bit closer here. And depending on where you are in that ladder principle, and we might hear discussion of the ladder principle, you'll hear it from myself, you'll likely hear it from uh, my friend as well. In Defense and Crown, we always call each other friends. <laughs> we do. To but each to each other's faces. <laughs> <laughs> and when we're in front of judges, current or former. Depending on where you are, if it's a relatively minor charge, individuals might be released on what's referred to as a promise to appear. It's pretty well our lowest form of release. It really just has the requirement that you show up to court. Now a lot of people who might get charged, for example, with a first shoplifting charge, uh, for a public mischief charge, which can be throwing rocks at a window, they don't have a record. This is their first engagement with the court process. Conditions that restrict their movement, who they can associate with, where they can be, what they can carry might not be appropriate. We're supposed to start with the lowest form of release possible to meet what we'll refer to as primary, secondary, and tertiary grounds. And a promise to appear can do that. It just says, you've, this is your court date, you've got to go show up. And we take a little bit step up higher than that, we're in a situation where we might be dealing with a release to an officer. Release to an officer tends to be, it's a fairly lower form of release, but it can have a number of conditions. A little bit more restricted as to the kinds of conditions that it can have. But that's where there might be a requirement that says, well, you've got to stay out of the Walmart because you've been shoplifting there recently. You've got to stay away from a particular person because your offenses maybe involve a person who requires some protection. Even if it's a first offense, well, you're throwing rocks at somebody's house, maybe you should stay away from that particular house. It doesn't involve a judge, doesn't involve a justice of the peace. It requires that you sign the conditions, you have to agree to abide by them, but you remain out of custody. That's typically a fairly quick form of release as well. It can sometimes be done even at the roadside, it can sometimes be done fairly quickly at a police detachment, but it tends to be quite quick. And again, it tends to involve individuals who are not individuals who have lengthy records and not particularly serious charges, although you can get into some more serious matters here. Then we start getting into where the courts are involved. And the way that the courts initially get involved with bail differs from one province to another. But in Alberta, um, fairly recently, um, we've instituted a program where there's a bail hearing office and a number of justices of the pieces who sit as bail judges. And so if you get a charge and it's, maybe you've got a record, maybe you've got breaches of your current, uh, prior charges, maybe it's a more serious offense, the police are not exercising their discretion, they're not releasing you on their own, on their own discretion, either by way of an uh, undertaking or release to an officer in charge. 
you'll sit in cells and you'll be brought before a essentially a telephone justice of the peace with a defense counsel typically there it can be a member of the private defense bar or it can be a, there's a duty counsel program for the bail hearing um, office and you'll have a crown prosecutor who's a crown prosecutor with Alberta Crown Prosecution Services um, I think believe there's two offices now one in Calgary one in Edmonton and that doesn't mean that your bail hearing will be contested. You might get released on consent, but it's a prosecutor who's reviewed it at that point in time and tried to determine appropriate conditions. And it can involve some discussions with that defense counsel. Is cash available? Um, what conditions are appropriate? Does the individual have a place to live that's maybe more suitable? Um, it can involve discussion in terms of sureties. It can involve a release, essentially, anywhere on what we'll, you might sometimes hear in the news about the ladder principle. And the ladder principle here, that's where we really get into it, it's about still we're supposed to release on the least onerous terms required to meet what I talked about before, primary, secondary, tertiary grounds. Before we go too much further, what are primary, what are secondary, what are tertiary grounds? code has a bit more of an in-depth explanation, but we'll take the Coles Notes version for here today. Primary grounds is really, are you going to show up to court? There's always a little bit of a distinction between are you going to show up to court for an adjournment purpose, or are you going to show up to court for your trial? The way that the courts have typically looked at it is, are you going to show up to deal with your matters? You're, are you going to engage in that process? Most individuals, that's a fairly straightforward question to answer. Often what we'll do is we'll take a look at the record. Has the individual shown up to court or failed to show up before? If they routinely fail to show up to court, we have a concern. If they don't have that kind of record, maybe we don't have that concern. It can involve other considerations as well. Where does the person live? Bigger questions if, well, you committed an offense or are alleged to have committed an offense in Alberta, but you live in Ontario, you live on the East Coast. Are you going to stick around to deal with them? It doesn't mean you'll get detained, but there might need to be some discussion about how, do we, how can we satisfy ourselves that you will show up. Secondary grounds gets a little bit more complex. Secondary grounds is really about are you going to commit further offenses? And that can be offenses against the same complainant slash victim. That can be offenses in general that in, endanger the public in some way, shape, or form or that are contrary to the administration of justice. Now here's where we start to get into some questions about recidivists or individuals who come back before the court um, sometimes time and again, sometimes with significant gaps. And different files have different considerations for secondary grounds. We'll often look at domestic violence type situations. Those can be quite complex because you're dealing with interpersonal relationships that are sometimes complicated, sometimes very dynamic, sometimes that deal with what we'll sometimes refer to as cycles of violence, sometimes that involve <coughs> specific isolated triggering events. These are complex situations. And when we're trying to resolve, and sometimes it has to go before a judge, for the judge to make the determination, are there conditions that prevent further offenses? To us, a required degree. It doesn't have to be perfect. If we asked for perfection of the bail program or the bail system, you could never be satisfied to 100% that a person will show up to court or that a person won't commit further offenses. 100%, no one would get released that would be a significant problem. People are entitled to release. People are presumed innocent. And yet some people will be detained despite the fact that they're still presumed innocent. And I believe my friend, um, this has to, she'll get into that in some more detail. But that's where we're at with secondary grounds. Is the person going to reoffend? And if we have concerns that they'll reoffend, are there appropriate conditions that will limit that risk? And a number of conditions sometimes come to mind fairly readily. A condition to stay away from a particular person. 
well, if the concern is always the same complainant, the same victim, and we're satisfied that a condition saying stay away will be abided by, that solves that problem. Sometimes it might be a curfew, particularly one that the police can go in and check on. So curfew between, often we'll see 9 p.m. to 6 a.m., and the police can come and check at your door and you're required to attend at the door to confirm you're there. Well, if you're not, they'll lay a breach charge, there'll be a warrant for your arrest, you're not abiding by your conditions, now there's a warrant. Now the police see you next go around, they arrest you on the warrant, you're back in custody, and your release might be more difficult or denied the second time around. The third ground of bail and again, we get kind of progressively more complicated, is it enumerates a number of factors. The courts have interpreted those enumerated grounds as not being exhaustive. So sometimes it's how se particularly serious matters, matters where you might be looking at a significant amount of time in custody, matters that involve firearms. Those are all listed, but tertiary grounds are always something to be considered. And it boils down essentially to a nutshell of would it offend the Canadian public, but a Canadian public who's knowledgeable about the bail system, knowledgeable about the presumptions of innocence, knowledgeable about, and my friend will certainly talk about glad do factors, so the often reported and statistically accurate overrepresentation of Indigenous individuals in pretrial detention, the difficulties that certain populations, whether that be Indigenous populations, populations with mental health issues, homeless populations, marginalized individuals have in securing stabilized housing. Would it offend the Canadian public, knowing all of these things, that the person was released? Again, I'm not using the strict legal test. I'm trying to kind of boil it down to more of a Coles Notes version and to an extent failing miserably at keeping it particularly short. But those are the factors that the court has to consider. And there are also the factors as, as a Crown Prosecutor, if I'm consenting to somebody's release, the Crown Prosecution has to consider as well. There are issues that when I was defense, and now that defense that I'm often arguing on the other side of, will argue is, well, here's a bail plan that meets those concerns. And it can look like a number of different things. It can look like money deposited. It can look like the right conditions. It can look like improvements in stability of housing. It can look like an individual who's applied to a treatment program. Often we'll see individuals who are before the courts for underlying reasons. And if those underlying reasons are being dealt with, and to an extent they can be dealt with pre-trial, that might, that might mean that the bail test can be met. We can also talk about well, where the onus lies. And again, here we're talking about once we're really typically in front of a judge. We're at the top end in terms of bail argument or top end of bail plans. Some of you might be aware of or have heard crown onus versus reverse onus. Most of the time, and this might change with some amendments coming into the criminal code that have been proposed for bail, but I would characterize as most of the time the crown bears the onus to satisfy the judge that the person should be detained. I have to kind of carry that weight as the prosecutor. I have to show why should they not be released. Individual, most offenses are crown onus. There are some that aren't. Certain trafficking related charges are reverse onus. Um, there's some offenses where significant violence that can be reverse onus. I don't propose to go through a complete list but most offenses would be crown onus. If you're out on release and you commit or alleged to have committed further offenses, that typically transfers it to a reverse onus type situation. But when it's crown onus, I've got to show the court, why are they not released? Why is somebody not releasable on the primary grounds? Why is somebody not releasable on the secondary grounds? Why is somebody not releasable on the tertiary grounds? And sometimes, it's not all three. There are many a file where I think the person will show up. I'm the prosecutor, I've looked at their record, I know they've got a counsel hired, there's some representations about where they live, they live locally, they'll engage. And even if there's hiccups, they'll still engage. 
but I have concerns about maybe one particular complainant, and it's reoffending in re uh, relation to that one particular complainant. So my argument is only on one basis. Sometimes it's on all three. Reverse onus is where the defense bears the burden of demonstrating that the individual is releasable. But throughout all of that, and we often look at this crown onus versus reverse onus, and we'll sometimes hear about it in the media as well. The thing that doesn't change is during the bail hearing, the individual is still presumed innocent. And it doesn't matter whether the onus is on the crown or the onus is on the defense, the person is still presumed innocent. And the thing that needs to be remembered in the courts have dealt with on a number of occasions on bail review applications, on appeals to the Supreme Court. Um, my friend might talk about Antic, might talk about uh, Zora to some extent. Uh, I don't want to put words in her mouth or <laughs> force her to talk about certain files or not. But when somebody is detained, it's somebody who the, we as a society, as the courts recognize, they are not guilty. They are innocent. Until the person is convicted of the crime, they're presumed innocent. And so when we're looking at the bail system, we're looking at the bail conundrum, and that's what we've called it, that's really one of the, that's somewhat of the conundrum of bail. It's not about, bail isn't about punishment, it's not about a penalty because the person's not convicted. And I think I'm out of time? Pretty much. Okay, um, but I, I think this might dovetail into what, where um, Ingrid here was going to go. But people who are detained at bail, they're still innocent. And I think that has to be remembered. I'll leave it there. There'll be some questions about my role. Ask away, but I'll cede the floor now. I think that's hopefully a decent spot to transition. <laughs> I'm not much of a um, technologically savvy person, but I have a student from France who's working in my office for a month, and I have to say that I was very lucky to have her help me so I could have a few slides. And um, this slide that is the first one is really uh, just summarizing some of the aspects of what uh, James talked to you about. And it's a really good place, if you're interested to know more about bail, to start. Um, so I, I just commend you to the Government of, Al uh, Government of Canada's website, this fact sheet, the bail process. So right there, number one, what is bail and what it's, its purpose is it has those three listed things. Uh, and those are the three grounds that James was talking about, to ensure those charged with an offense appear in court to maintain public safety by assessing and managing any potential risks. That's ground two and ground three to maintain the public's confidence in the justice system. So I just wanted to show you, um, and if you have an interest in this topic, look it up. Um, I didn't put it all in there and it, it appears that it might be a little bit too hard for people to read from the screen, but it is worth uh, looking at. And what, number two, and just, maybe just to highlight because this idea of the presumption of innocence is central to our legal system, right? Are, are you waving at him? Oh, sorry. Closer to the mic. Yes. Closer to the mic? Okay. So, um, and it's because of our legal system that we've adopted um, that puts at the forefront this presumption of innocence and it's guaranteed by our Charter of Re Rights and Freedoms. So it's constitutionally um, imposed on us as people involved in the criminal justice system. We have to respect... Just step away a bit. We have to respect that um, these are constitutional norms that are imposed on us as people 
whether we're defense, crown, or judges involved in the criminal justice system. Okay, so that's really paramount to understand. So um, then, how do I go to the next one? Just click here. Okay, so the reason that this is topical, and I think I was uh, approached, as was James, to speak on this topic is because it's in the news. And this particular case of uh, the police officer in Ontario, Constable Perchala, who was a one-year mem this isn't him, this is the top cop in Ontario, but uh, <laughs> the, the news article says he demands that bail change be made because of this officer's death, right? So Officer Perchala was killed by a man who was released on bail in relation to violent offenses, and so the outrage, you know, I mean, we as a society are justifiably outraged by the death of this police officer, but the fact that he, a person did it while he was on bail brings, to, you know, this topic of bail in particular into the um, current discussion especially, right? And there have been a few other recent cases like that that have really upped the, um, the discussion. And, you know, politicians are part of that as well, right, Mr. Polyevra? So um, some might consider, you know, yes, this is a, a, a important topic and we have to look into the issues of bail, and others might argue that it's pandering to the politics of fear um, to, you know, make hay of the current issue for political reasons, right, for votes, to say, I'm going to be tough on this issue, I'm going to do address it these, these ways, we're going to make bail harder, it's going to be even harder to get bail as a, as a means to, um, you know, attract voters to a, your cause. But for, for my part, and the criticism is pretty universal, you know, tinkering with our bail system is probably not going to do much to lead us to a safer society, right? Um, that's that's the universal, basically, point of, you know, it, do we really need to make very many adjustments to how we grant bail, and are those adjustments going to meet the constitutional um, scrutiny that we are all bound by? So, uh, just a consideration, right? Will, will making changes to bail, and this is kind of why we call it a conundrum, will that really make us a safer society? Will it address the social problems contributing to crime, especially the growing divide between rich and poor in our society, um, ineffective crime prevention strategies, and then those huge systemic issues of uh, chronic mental health problems? and. Now we don't institutionalize people suffering from mental health in mental health facilities, we institutionalize them in our correctional facility, facilities. And then also the effects of, of course, colonization in terms of the uh, issues facing indigenous people and, and the fact of, of as James uh, alluded to or spoke to, overrepresentation of indigenous people in our system. So I wanted to just, uh, Next slide. Um, proposed reforms for the um, bail system. So James talked a little bit about how, in some circumstances, the onus shifts to the defense to show cause or to justify to the court why an accused person should be um, given liberty pending the trial. So should should be granted bail. And the basic thrust of all of the proposals that are now before Parliament to change our bail provisions really just increase the reverse onus provisions. So in, in all aspects, basically, it are intended to make it more difficult for people to achieve bail pending their trials. Um, so they are creating new reverse onus provisions to target serious repeat violent offending involving weapons, expanding the list of firearms offenses that would trigger re reverse onus, broaden the reverse onus targeting repeat offenders in inter intimate partner violence, what we used to call domestic violence, and, and a couple of other strategies. So. Whereas um, some might say our system is already um, 
pretty challenging for a lot of uh, offenders to achieve bail. Um, the intended reforms will make it effectively make it harder for many to achieve bail. And I wanted to address this kind of uh, the lingo in our um, you know society now, the social media and the effects of the Americanization of our uh, of our broadcasting systems, where we just think everything that happens down there is the same as here and. People talk uh, a lot about this catch and release system, so they they think that people just automatically get bail, and it's just so not true. Last night, I was visiting with a fellow defense lawyer, and he told me he had 22 prisoners on his on his list of of current files that he had, and I have a lot too. I don't usually tally them, but I frankly have a lot who are in custody awaiting. Uh, trial and it is not my experience that um, we have a catch and release system. Um, frankly, I find it very challenging for some offenders in particular to get them released pending trial if they have um, challenges as far as homelessness, addiction and any kind of a prior criminal record. So um, the, the issues and the practical challenges to obtaining bail are considerable. Um, things like the timing so and, and the effects of not getting bail are serious, right? If you're charged with a crime and you don't get bail within 48 hours, you might do and some of the following things might happen to you. You might lose custody of your children. Social workers will come and take them away um, if someone else can't care for them. You might lose your job, right? If you're in, detained for a couple of weeks pending a release hearing, you might not have still have a place to go home to because your landlord might have um, thrown out all your belongings out of your apartment, right? There's, there's impacts to what happens. So more and more, the timing of bail, it's getting harder to have a very quick bail hearing. The, the fact that we have these JPs over the phone, most people, like, if I'm going to run a bail hearing and some dude is on the other end of the line who I've never heard of, I don't know who it is, I'm going to tell my client, that's pretty risky, right? Like, it could be some guy that I think is terrible and, you know, the chances are slim this guy is going to consider your release. Why would you take that chance, right? So you're going to delay it maybe a day or two till you can get your client into provincial court. Well, now it's called the Alberta Court of Justice, but until you can get your client before a judge where you think you have a good opportunity to make a strong case to get your client released. So there's going to be delay. There's delay in getting information about the charges from the Crown. Not usually terrible, but there is a delay usually uh, in terms of a number of days before you get the information about what your client is charged with. Um, and now there's this interesting trend where the defense is told, and this, when I started practice 28 years ago, this was not the case. We used to go to court and I would come and I would tell the judge about my client's plans for his release. But now the expectation, especially amongst some crowns fairly strong, is that I have to go to them and give them all the information I have about what I plan on behalf of my client in terms of release before the hearing so that they can vet it and that they can, you know, um, maybe send police officers out to check out whether the person that I propose my client would live with is a legitimately good person or whatever. So those things also can cause delay. A couple of days while the police officers undertake this investigation or otherwise. Um, and then in our bail system, it is becoming more and more um, uh, typical that you have to rely on someone like a surety so you can achieve your bail if someone can come forward who acts as a surety for you. So they're willing to put forward either cash or to uh, attach some kind of their property um, to say, I vouch for this person. And uh, that doesn't always happen, especially if you live in Laverne on the blood reserve and you don't even have like property that is technically your property. Maybe you have a car, but your house is not attachable. Uh, there are issues like that. Um, ankle bracelets always get thrown around. In 28 years of practice, I've never had a client released on an ankle bracelet. Have you ever? 
we don't have that as part of our everyday what we can avail ourselves of um, probably would be a good idea either if the state pays for it it's a very expensive right so you as taxpayers are going to uh, fund a system that would provide for ankle bracelets to monitor people while they're on release or else only rich people who can pay for ankle bracelets will get released right so um, the, in particular challenges for homeless drug addicted people people with other social disadvantages like uh, mental illness um, and then indigenous people in general the the structural barriers to obtaining release are serious and significant and i could enumerate them but i will run out of time so I wanted to address because um, one of the one of the um, things that often gets cited is this, you know, notion that crime is out of control and it's so bad and we have to do something and therefore we must make it even harder for people to achieve bail while they're awaiting trial. And the police reported crime rates in Canada actually seem to show the the bottom line, that green line on the screen is violent offenses and there is a real um, a real uh, trend over time if you look at the bigger numbers of kind of a stable level of crime so it's not like skyrocketing as people sometimes describe uh, there is a trend just in the last few years of a little increase but um, it's below what was at say 2000 we're still well below that um, there is has been a, a, an upward trend from 2014 to 2018 it went down a little bit and up a little bit during the beginning stages of um, covid and there isn't really much social science to tell us why this last trend is is happening but in terms of the overall trend and of serious violent crime, it is not skyrocketing. And for our politicians to say it is, is just, again, I view it as that pandering tendency that some have to alarm us and to cause us all to be fearful. There is a lot of um, discussion because of the uh, insistence on politically on tougher bail measures. Uh, there's a lot of discussion in social science circles and amongst people involved in the criminal system about is this going to help and a lot of people take this position that tighten bail restrictions are unlikely to verb uh, curb violent crime and This is kind of an alarming statistic. 70% of those in provincial jails right now are legally innocent in that sense right there. They haven't been found guilty of a crime. They haven't been, they haven't pleaded guilty or been found gu guilty. It's time. Uh, and they're in pretrial detention. So this, this is uh, kind of an alarming number, I think. When you think of our little jail out there, so 70% of the people in that jail have not yet been found guilty. They're just awaiting trial. So when you think of this whole catch and release nonsense, why do we have a jail there where 70% of the people haven't been found guilty yet? Um, and this is also very alarming. These are John Howard Society um, a, a study that showed that Canada's proportion of pretrial detention prisoners to total prisoners is shockingly high. And we like to think of ourselves as Canadians, as this progressive society, we're better than Americans. Well, have a look at this. 11.7% pretrial detention in England and Wales. United States, 22%. Canada, 38.7%. That, that slide talked about the reputational damage to Canada. If, and I have my young French student here, and I think it's been kind of enlightening for her to see the, uh, how our justice system really works traipsing around with me for the last few weeks um, and the actual problems. This is one of the problems, pretrial deaths, numbers of deaths in Ontario provincial institutions. 
So there's a higher likelihood of deaths. You know, if 70% of the population are uh, awaiting trial, deaths going up, despair and other issues. And then I do want to end um, with a few minutes, if I could, on, on the really serious issue for our community because, frankly, um, this is so prevalent here. And uh, the, the fact of the over-involvement of Indigenous people in our criminal s system globally is serious. Um, it, the, the, a study done talks about um, some of the factors. So, like, if you live in Laverne on the Blood Reserve, I don't know if you know where Laverne is. It's not Standoff. Standoff is the biggest community. It's right on Highway 2. Laverne is just near Glenwood. So you just, I use that as a reference because I always think of a guy from Laverne, you know, he's got court in Cardston. It's literally about 25 to 30 minutes by car to get to Laverne, from Laverne to Cardston. That's where you're going to appear for the first time. If you have to report to the police while you're on release, you're going to report in Standoff or Cardston. How do you get from Laverne to Standoff or Cardston if you don't have a bus, a car, someone in your family who has a vehicle? So the fact is that where James, James was talking about, well, we look at their records. And people are getting a little bit more savvy to this now, but you know, Oftentimes, Indigenous offenders have worse records for things like not showing up in court. But there are huge issues, both in terms of just practical, the practical aspect of how do you get to court if you are, you know, maybe you have intellectual deficits, maybe you have uh, no one in your family, maybe your auntie and your mother, who you've always relied on, have just died <laughs> from from some serious incident, right? Drug addiction, overdose, car accident, who knows? I mean, those are the facts of life for many, many people. And uh, it, you know, they, they're then saddled with these criminal records for petty, minor, um, administrative type of offenses, yet those are often the reasons why we cite that they shouldn't be released. Uh, and then studies have shown a clear racial disparity in Canada's bail decisions. So black people are more likely than white people to be refused bail when charged with similar offenses. And according to government data, indigenous people are more likely to be denied bail and are overrepresented in remand. I'll end with this. I, I have lots more to say, but... Um, our, um, I participated widely in the um, residential school settlement process. I represented over 350 people across Canada who were uh, in residential schools and suffered serious physical abuse and sexual and or sexual abuse in those schools. And so this is really close to my heart because I, those stories are tied up here and here um, until I go. Um, so. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which was a part of the whole uh, resolution of the lawsuit, the um, class action lawsuit against the government of Canada and the churches, um, the Truth and Reconciliation um, Commission wrote uh, a report and then um, issued a number of calls to action. One of the calls to action number 30, we call upon federal, provincial and territorial governments to commit to eliminating the overrepresentation of Aboriginal people in custody over the next decade and to issue detailed annual reports that monitor and evaluate progress in doing so. And to be honest, we are just failing, utterly failing in this regard. Not only since this call to action was done, but there have been so many, um, you know, the Royal Commission into the status of Indigenous people and other reports that have cited the overrepresentation issue. I mean, it, it falls off our tongues now. We talk about it all the time. Yet, um, in the last 20 years, any statistics in relation to Indigenous people have just skyrocketed. Um, Indigenous, this is an article from 2020, and Indigenous inmates make up 45% of all people in Alberta's federal institutions. So that's where you get sentenced to two years or more. I mean, that's kind of a shocking number, right? Because inst uh, 
Indigenous people make up four to six percent of our population in Alberta, and the statistics are egregious right across Canada. Um, the latest, anyway, that's where I wanted to end. I think that um, I think we need to think about the broader way of addressing social problems and including criminality, violence in our society, and that tinkering with bail is not a meaningful way of spending. Uh, of addressing these issues from my from my humble perspective. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we have a few minutes for questions and uh, in the interest of time I won't go through some of the housekeeping things here. Uh, we want to thank the university uh, of course for their support, uh, LSCO for providing this room and Shaw TV and Bridge City TV for recording the sessions. You can watch them on, on uh, Shaw Spotlight TV or our website and thank you to the Lethbridge Herald as well for being here for their coverage. Uh, next week we have Dwayne Bratt who is going to be talking about uh, the election, I guess. Will Daniel Smith heed the election message voters have sent to her? And uh, it's time for questions. So line up here where Marie is, and we expect respectful discourse, of course. Everybody be polite, as I'm sure you all will be. And we'll start. Oh, if you want to just go up. Thanks, Violet. And I think this first question will be for James. Um, and I'm coming from a perspective that uh, I was victimized many years ago, and uh, an ROR, uh, recognizance or um, order of recognizance, was given, and I never filed charges against my ex-husband immediately. Like abuse had gone on for eight years, I probably could have been filing charges for eight years. So when he was arrested, he was immediately released, and. Um, I don't think it's bail that needs to be uh, adjusted. I think, as uh, you had said, Ingrid, the whole system needs to be revamped. And I will tell you that from for 25 years up to 2011, the number of people in federal corrections, because I worked in federal corrections for 32 years, reduced every single year. Tough on Crime was brought in in 2011, and from 2011 until I left Ottawa in 2012, the number of people in federal con uh, corrections had gone up by 1,800 people. That's four new institutions across the country. That's huge. And it shouldn't be happening because the overall system is flawed. And certainly we recognize that. And people saying, you know, you gotta be tough on crime. No, you have to figure out why people are committing crime in the first place. And as you said, mental health is a big issue. But it, the question for you is, um, I, I'd been uh, assaulted many times, but I only filed charges twice. And the first time he was released, in domestic violence cases, when a person goes for parole, yes, he's presumed or she is presumed innocent, but there may be a whole history of violence that went on before. So that uh, recognizance order was only worth the paper that it was written on because he continued to assault me and the police were called 16 times in two weeks. So uh, yes, we need to do something, but it's not bail that needs to be addressed. Anyway, if you can comment on that. Um, I think I can, I think one of the difficulties for, for this forum and for talking about bail is, and I think we both touched on it, and I think this question touches on it directly, bail is a small part of the criminal justice system. And not everything can be solved with bail reform, and we can argue back and forth as to what good bail reform would look like. and whether tinkering or changes where that will help, where it might not. For that particular kind of scenario, and I don't know when this all happened, um, and I've been fairly recent to the bar, but some of the things that we do look at that aren't necessarily bail reform is there have been changes in, in intimate partner violence, for instance, we now get, as long as the complainant slash victim participates in that, we get a family violence impact report 
which that is a document that the Crown and Defence would have access to, but the Crown has access to it to determine, one of the questions is, is this the first time this has happened? And that can include some details about prior instances of violence that went unreported. Mm -hmm. That can assist. Eye track reports are another type of report we get more infrequently, but can also assist there. But when the question or the question slash comment is whether bail reform will assist in that kind of scenario, because in, in that situation, the release to an officer in charge was routinely, in that particular instance, just disobeyed. Whether bail reform can fix that, I don't. I don't know if bail reform can fix that. I would be suspicious if it could. One of the issues is bail reform doesn't really touch on the root causes of some of this behavior. Mm -hmm. Bail doesn't do much with respect, or quite frankly, often doesn't do anything with respect to, well, the accused has an addiction. The accused has mental health issues. The accused has any number of underlying issues. That gets dealt with in different parts of the system. That can sometimes be dealt with to some extent on a sentencing, but that also, I think, has to be dealt with outside of the criminal justice system. There is an element, I think, where once matters come into the criminal justice system, once there's a charge, there have been a number of problems that have led up to that where people have slipped through the cracks other systemic issues in social safety nets that have not been maybe properly used or, quite frankly, sometimes available. There's often this history that brings people before the courts. I think it's rare, although not, it's not that it's never happened, but I think that it's rare that the courts see somebody charged and there's no history, there's no explanation, there's no rationale for why the person is here. We don't often see this unexplained violence, this unexplainable property offenses. I don't remember the last time I prosecuted somebody in their 50s who decided after a you know, 50 year of happy life, decided to walk into the Walmart and steal batteries just for the fun of it. What I've seen is individuals who are selling the batteries because they don't have an income stream. They're destitute, there's, there's usually some rationale behind it, and I don't believe the criminal justice system can quite frankly f properly fix that in isolation, and certainly bail as a small part of that criminal justice system. I don't think bail can fix every problem. I don't think bail reform as contemplated would have fixed that. I don't know what will, but it's likely systemic changes on a number of areas and the difficulty, I think, always with that is I mean, the, the truth and reconciliation. We, they, they even talked seeing a reduction over the next decade. It takes a lot of time. And you don't see the results right away. But you kind of got to power through it. And that's difficult to do because it costs money. It takes time, resources, tectonic shifts in how sometimes we look at certain things. And I'm not here with an answer to that, unfortunately. If I did have an answer to that, I don't know, I'd be, <laughs> that'd be something special. <laughs> um, and I don't want to take too much time with that answer, and sadly my answer is a non-answer on that one. Good morning and thank you for the talk. A very quick question. I believe I heard one, of, one or other of the speakers saying that the provision of ankle bracelets was very expensive. How much do they cost? Thank you. So I have never had a client in 28 years who's been able to get an ankle bracelet. I just heard about some guy from, I think, Calgary got released with an ankle bracelet and had to pay for it privately. I have no idea how much it costs. But Danielle Smith, as one of her uh, pledges in her um, running up to the election, um, spoke about a system that would m monitor people using ankle bracelets and I think if I'm not mistaken I'm just going by my memory but if it was sort of a system-wide paid for um, type of service so um, the government 
issued ankle bracelets if you agreed to release my guy on um, a condition that he'd be monitored by an ankle bracelet. I, the sum was like six million dollars for the pro a province-wide no program through Alberta. That was the sum that I remember reading. So it's going to be expensive. It's either going to be private or it's going to be funded. Um, yeah. So if you're a doctor and you get charged with some serious violent crime, then you probably have a good, pretty good chance of getting released if you can afford an ankle bracelet. But if you're you know, a person who's homeless and drug addicted, and you're less likely probably to get that, you know. And Thank you. And I, I can just dovetail on that a tiny little bit because it, in my prior life as defense counsel, I investigated it once for a client. This is going back a number of years. Um, but the at that point, the initial down payment rental fee for the ankle monitor, um, I believe was in the low to mid four figures. I want to say it was around $1,500 as an initial like getting on your ankle um, install fee. And then it was a monthly fee after that that I believe was in the high three figures um, to keep it there. Um, I forget the name of the company. It also varied on the level of monitoring required because it's a private company that monitors um, the signal and that private company then has to report to the police. So there's, when it's a private system as well, I think there's a number of, of difficulties in how that gets properly monitored. Um, but it was quite, yeah, quite expensive. And again, four figures is that you're, you're making some money if you can make that as a down payment. Hi, my name is Laurie Schultz, Ingrid and James. Thank you very much for a very informative talk. You've left us with uh, a lot to ponder. Thank you. Um, my question is in regards to whether or not there's a, do you both, as Defense and Crown, have the capacity to work with the drug court options or there's a um, domestic violence or an intimate partner program, I believe it operates out of around in southern Alberta where the abuser in the home can, can leave and go into um, a program, a residential program, while things are being sorted out. And uh, it, it does save the, the other partner and children leaving the home and, and all of the, uh, they're not the initial, you know, the, the main breadwinner can be very, um, well, it has all of those issues, right? So I'm wondering, in your release proposals or bail proposals, do you use, do you access the drug court and, and again, I wish I could remember the name of this program, um, where the, the uh, alleged abuser can, can leave? Uh, is that an option? So um, we, as defense counsel, we really, I mean, for myself, I guess I should just speak for myself, but I think my colleagues a lot are, are a little in a light position because we're under pressure from our clients to help get them released. And also for me, because it's my, my passion is trying to help people use their experience in the criminal justice system as a means to reflect on their life and to um, consider change. You know, to say, why am I here? Why have I been charged? Why is my family in this situation? What can I do to make things better? And there are people that do that, surprisingly, maybe to some, but, you know, people get charged and, and use that as a means to improve their life, to say, you know, like the alcoholic who's, you know, maybe a nice guy most of the time, but when he's drunk, he beats his wife. And that's not every domestic violence person, but that's some of them, right? Like some of them are just, because of their alcoholism, they're more prone to violence when they're drunk. If we can address the alcoholism, then, you know, less likelihood of reoffending. So we tried to, all kinds of strategies to try to get people into programs that help. It's tough, right? This, I mean, our society is more and more like 
you know, access to beds and treatment, it's really hard. People have to, waiting lists and, uh, you know, beds and treatment. Okay, you can have a bed three months down the road, but you have to go to the detox, like, for so long, and you got to get your bed in the detox. And so it's tough. We try to do those kind of things. Um, de that, that One of the happiest moments in my life over the last year was getting to watch my, one of my clients graduate from drug treatment court. One of the most moving, moving things I've done. And I I remember this man coming to Cardston Provincial Court, like his teeth, he had little jagged remnants of teeth. Like there were, I don't know if you've ever seen a guy that does lots of meth and really bad drugs, and the effects over a lengthy period of time on their teeth sometimes is just outrageous. Like they're like sharp little things. And, and he was like a big man, maybe 6'1", six, 6'2", six, and he was probably like 115 pounds, just skin and bones, hunched over, coming in there with these teeth, just, you know, the skin tone, everything awful, like you just could cry, you know, seeing this person in this state, right? And um, I, I begged and pleaded with him to to take stock, you know, to say, why am I here? What's going on? And he was charged with a serious trafficking in fentanyl charge. Not much of a he prior history. He had really, like, very, one of these people who, you know, had raised children and was, like, maybe 40-ish, but the d addictions had taken such a curve and then into the fentanyl and really serious drugs, and suddenly he was trafficking. So he didn't have a huge history. And by the grace of God, somehow um, we got him into drug treatment court, and he um, he graduated, and he was like one of the success stories. Everyone in the courtroom who came to participate in his graduation was crying. It was so moving. So we do do that, and there are good stories. There there are some successes. Domestic violence. I just want to say, I find it a big conundrum, and I think that you know we have these like very black and white ways of looking at all these problems that are just so stupid, like frankly, with all due respect to the <laughs> provincial government who, you know, puts, starts these things. But so like you have gradations of violence, right? Like you have these serious guys who beat their wives and it's constant intimidation and fear and whatever. And then you have like a 19-year-old indigenous kid who with his little girlfriend, they're going to U of L and they have one little baby and he comes home drunk one night and then pushes her because she's mad at him because he came home drunk and he gets charged with domestic violence and he has a condition not to have contact with her. So guess what she does? She doesn't abide by it. She tells him, come home, because she's going to lose her place to live. She's not going to be able to take care of their little baby, get her baby back and forth to daycare, get to the university without his help. And they're both funded and only able to maintain their apartment with their funding. So poosh, it all goes up in smoke, or else he gets charged a week later because some neighbor sees them together and calls the cops on them so then he gets a breach so he's now a violent domestic violence offender and gets a breach so i don't know i don't know the answers but those cases make me nuts because i think there's no discretion and they impose no contact every time so you know you can't get your offender into this special program until his girlfriend goes and does her indoctrination session at the ywca about domestic violence and then she gets to say okay i don't want this condition anymore and then you go to talk to the crown and the crown will say well you know sorry <laughs> I'm just... I'll, I'll take my loss but you know anyway it's tough and it's not it doesn't make sense in a lot of situations it makes sense in the bad situations but in the minor ones we're doing these things to people we're creating criminal uh, criminality where there shouldn't be and so uh, there are no easy answers in my view but yeah this will be the last oh. Hi there, Sarah Amy's. Um, I work and represent the Downtown Business Revitalization Zone. On May 29th, we had an extremely busy day. Uh, there were six break and enters across the city, four of which were in the downtown, three of which were on 6th Street, two of which were perpetrated by the same person. That person was found in the second establishment that she broke into with bags from the first establishment. So, presumably, she had done both, the MOs were the same. She was let out that day, that night. She was taken in, and given what we have heard from you, and I, please don't get me wrong, I have so much empathy 
but a lot of the activity that we see every day in the downtown goes completely counter to business revitalization. So could I have some thoughts from you as to why she may well have been released after potentially two um, uh, criminal activities in one day? And uh, how does that help this woman? Yeah. Sure. Um, so, in terms of what might have gone in, I, I can't. I, I can't speak to a particular case. I wouldn't speak to a particular case, quite frankly. Um, but without knowing that individual's prior criminal record, which is not a perfect gauge, but my friend has gone into that in a little bit in her presentation. It's it's not a perfect gauge. But. The question ends up being, again, it's these primary, secondary, and tertiary ground concerns. And bail, we, we've gotten through the Supreme Court now. The conditions we put, they're, not, they're there to deal with those three things. A person show up to court, will they commit further offenses? Again, that's an oversimplification, but that's the gist of it. And will it offend the Canadian public if the person got released? The Canadian public knows everything about the bail system. It's not there to try to fix somebody's addiction issue. It's not there to, we're not to put conditions to fix somebody's mental health issues. While those types of conditions might be put in place, um, often by some agreement between Crown and Defense, because the underlying issue touches on one of those concerns, bail's not there to fix people. It's there to deal with, they're gonna show up, going to commit further offenses, would it offend the Canadian public? And for this, the, the fact scenario that we've been given here, I don't know how strong or weak the Crown case might have been. I don't know what the person's record might have been. From this description, it's a non-violent offense, and that certainly has an impact. And from a downtown business perspective, I can certainly appreciate, well, Nonviolent is one thing, but what about the shop that's been broken into four times? What about the shop that's been broken into ten times? What about the shop that's been had their windows smashed up ten times that cost? Again, bail's not there to fix the problem of crime. Bail, when we're dealing with it, really deals with one person. Because we're not going to detain John Doe or Jane Smith for committing property offenses downtown to try to fix the problem of property offenses downtown. We're there to deal with Jane Doe or John, or Jane Doe, John Smith, whatever names I used. It's that person. Bail is for that individual. And that's why it's part of a broader system. It's part of other, other aspects in place. And we can do a lengthy conversation about deterrence and denunciation under the criminal code and rehabilitation. We could likely have longer than an hour just on that topic alone. We could have lengthy conversations about, again, social programs and where are we going to put a, let's say, a rehabilitation center so that people will access it, but it's what neighborhood is it going to be in? There's been significant discussions in Lethbridge about that exact issue. And again, these are all problems that there's no simple, elegant solution to them. But for that one, she's found in the one business where the break and enter has happened, the property from another break and enter. I can understand how it would be aggravating for the business owner to see that person released. But if she didn't have a record, and even if she did, I can see a release being in place there as long as it addressed. Is she going to show up to court? Is she, not anybody else, but is she going to commit further offenses? And it would it offend the Canadian public that she is released, not that everybody doing this kind of thing is released, not whether or not it will solve this bigger problem. And I think that's where as well, when we hear discussion about bail and bail reform and changing things, whether it's adding reverse onus provisions, whether it's changing situations in which or how we define intimate partner violence for the purposes of reverse onus, they all deal with these narrow slices of issues. But bail on its own isn't going to fix every systemic problem that the criminal justice might have. Mm, excuse me. 
criminal justice system might have or that society might have. It's there to deal with a discrete issue. It's there to deal with that person. And is their detention at the end of the day required to meet one, two, or three? Because that's where the detention is supposed to happen. When it's required to meet one of those things, if a plan exists, they're supposed to be released. And I'll dovetail just a tiny little bit on the last question because there was a conversation about drug treatment court, and that was a bit more intimate partner violence and drug-related offense. Drug treatment court, I just want everyone to be clear, an incredible shout out to every participant who's an accused, defense counsel, judge, clerk, crown prosecutor who's dealt with the drug treatment court program. It, it, it really is beautiful to watch somebody graduate from it. It's not really about bail though. You get bail typically. He wouldn't have had a chance to do it if he didn't have bail. Well, and there's that. There, there, there's this combination. It's not that it is, it's a diversion program for on a conviction, and that dovetails into bail, and some individuals who might otherwise have been denied release, if we can deal with the underlying problem, which for drug treatment court is addictions to narcotics, such that the person won't come back before the courts for other offenses, that deals with, will they show up to court? Are they gonna commit further offenses? Would it offend the Canadian public? I'm sorry, if the person's willing to participate in sometimes a two year long drug treatment program and deal with that issue, bail to provide them that opportunity, because they get the ball rolling, they get it started, bail is quite strict often at the beginning of the drug treatment court program, then we're dealing with one, two, and three. In terms of places for somebody to live when there's intimate partner violence allegations, I'm not familiar with, the, we didn't have the name of the program. I'm not familiar with that particular program. A place to live is often one of the big issues because it's the concern from the Crown of, well, we've got Jane Doe and John Smith and Jane Doe's been charged with assaulting John Smith. If she's going to be released, where is she going to live? Because the Crown might take the view, can't be with the, the complainant, can't be with the victim. Her unfortunate situation might be, I don't have ability to live anywhere else. I don't have family in the area. Uh, my employment is uh, perhaps marginal if existent. I can't pay rent somebody somewhere else. I don't have another place to live. That's a problem. And that's a problem when we come to, again, one, two, and three, because sometimes that needs to be in place in order to ensure, most predominantly, that they won't re-offend in some way, because often there's a strong incentive to go back home. It's cold. I want to go home. I've been at the shelter for two days and it's unpleasant. I want to go back home. My kids are at home. I want to go back home. That's a strong incentive. That's a strong urge to go back. And there's not another place to properly call home during that period of time. And. Sometimes defense can get like that sorted. A defense a counsel often do great work in putting together these plans. And again, I'll dovetail on what my friend said. It takes time. How are you gonna find another place to live overnight? Who are you gonna call? Who's gonna say yes? All of a sudden, you've been in custody not one day, but it's two, it's four, it's five, it's 10, while you get that sorted. And in the meantime, the job that didn't pay perhaps very well is now gone and your situation is that much harder. And there's not necessarily an elegant solution to that that works for everybody. I'll, I've gone at length here, and I guess there's a joke about ask a lawyer to do anything for 15 minutes and you'll get about an hour. <laughs> I, including, and prior members of the bench will likely be familiar when we say, oh, we just need 15 minute break. <laughs> it's not a 15 minute break. Um, the courts in general, and bail maybe more particularly, there's, it's a bit of a blunt instrument. It's not a scalpel, it's not, it's a system that's tried to be designed to deal with everybody who's part of it. And it's not very particularized in broad strokes. And when we take a look, and whether it's, you know, my friend had an officer who died. When we take a look in trying to create a, a system to target one specific incident, bail deals with everybody 
in one way, shape, or another, whether it's on a promise to appear, a release to an officer, bail in front of a in front of the Alberta Court of Justice, bail review, wherever it happens, it's dealing with everybody in one way, shape, or form who's been charged with an offense. And to try to have that system be designed based off one specific incident, it's got to deal with everybody. And because I, in my view, because it has to deal with everybody, just like any system that would have to deal with everybody, I don't know how you can make that perfectly deal with everybody. I don't think there's a way to do it. And so bail will always, I think, be flawed in one way or another if, because of how it's designed or if only because every accused, every victim, every defense lawyer, every crown prosecutor, and every judge who touches it are all human until AI takes over. <laughs> I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much, James and Edgar. That was really enlightening for all of us, including myself. I can't believe you don't have electronic monitors here. My gosh. I used them for years in Saskatchewan. Anyway, um, thank you both. I don't know if there's any. I think you probably summed up what you needed to say. Um, so thank you very much for coming. <laughs>